On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Team Workouts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. For those of you who missed our earlier sessions featuring Oran Pamuk, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Margaret Atwood, Neil Gaiman, Megha Majumdar, Sujeev Sakhya, Navdeep Sarna, Vidya Dehjia, and so many others, you can catch these on our Facebook JLF Lit Fest or on our YouTube channel Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Our official radio partner. is red fm bajate raho our first session today is vikram chandra the sacred and the profane in conversation with devapriya roy award winning and best selling author software developer and distinguished academic vikram chandra takes us through his many lives as he discusses his many obsessions writing coding literature digital narratives sanskrit texts and so much more with devapriya roy Vikram Chandra is the author of Geek Sublime Sacred Grains which is now a Netflix series Love and Longing in Bombay Re- and Red Earth and Pouring Rain he's also co-founder of granthika.co a startup reinventing writing for the digital age he teaches creative writing at the University of California Berkeley Devapriya Roy is the author of three novels The Vague Woman's Handbook The Weight Loss Club and most recently friends from college in 2018 she published indira a graphic biography of mrs gandhi created with artist priya kurian ro is best known for the travel memoir the heat and dust project the broke couples guide to bharat co-written with partner saurav cha which debuted at number 1 on the hindustan nielsen uh, list Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section below. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel JLF, a uh, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Ladies and gentlemen, Vikram Chandra, the sacred and the profane, in conversation with Devapriya Roy. Over to you, Devapriya. Thank you, Shanjay. Hello everyone and welcome to what is going to be a scintillating evening with Vikram Chandra. Uh Vikram since the theme of our evening is the sacred and the profane um I'm going to begin with this question and take you back to the past a little bit. You know how one hears of writers doing all kinds of odd jobs when they're writing their very first book that most sacred of all sacred acts uh the waitress they teach i've heard of one writer being a magician but yours to me was the oddest of all odd jobs because vikram when you were writing um one of the drafts of red earth in pouring rain you worked as a computer consultant and you even wrote code now in in the circle uh I am a part of the writers that I know they can barely plug their laptop on and um you know find where to put the wifi password so will you tell us how that came to be sure so um you know when uh, I came to the states as an undergrad and uh, I I had never actually seen a computer until I came to the states right because at the time uh, the only places where we had computers and mainframes uh, or many computers at that was in corporate offices uh, or in government offices or the IITs right uh, but I was a big Isaac Asimov fan and so as soon as I got to the states you know I uh, signed up for a programming class and started to hang out in the computer class uh, labs uh but i have to say i found it really boring right because it was taught in a really abstracted way yeah. uh like you know sort this list of words and you know so i could do it but like so what's the point is <laughs> i can't really do anything with it so it wasn't until after undergrad uh i finished my ba and then i was in uh new york uh, uh going to film school at columbia um and I I really desperately needed a job right because there's I could hard I mean New York and then Columbia is very expensive nobody was giving scholarships for uh, MFAs in filmmaking mm-hmm. uh, so I found this very strange job of a job board and it said uh, needed scribes <laughs> like what the hell is a scribe yeah. so I go off and it's this tiny medical company which is um writing you know you doctor if you if you claimed insurance from your um uh from your insurance company for an injury uh your doctor 
uh, your insurance company would hire these doctors who would say, oh, the fact that you're limping has nothing to do with, you know, the car accident. It, you've had it since you're, you know, five years old. <laughs> mm-hmm. So these guys would scroll over these, uh, scroll these little reports in their bad doctor handwriting. And there was a bunch of us who had to type this up. So mm-hmm. it would go to be, you know, signed and then be taken to court. Um, and when we, I first started doing it, it was manual typewriters, uh, ele- electric typewriters, horrible. Mm-hmm. And then they got their first PCs. And then as soon as I had my own computer, I discovered I could make my life a lot easier by writing very simple macros, they're called, right, in, inside uh, the word processing programs. And then I just got obsessed. Um, so I'm a very self-trained program. I, I mean, a, like even a mid-level computer science starts to make my head hurt. But I worked my way through that writing on that first novel by doing programming and consulting in, in the Houston area. And, and I was very lucky. It was incredibly lucky that I fell into that. And it's great that you stayed with this obsession, right? It began in your youth, but you stayed with it so much so that it's not only your new book, Geek Sublime, but also Granthika, which is a whole software for writers. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here and confess that I signed up for it. Okay. And (laughs) I actually tried uh, to put this little work in progress that I have into... I don't know, into that manuscript format. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. Will you tell us all about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so about the time when I started writing Sacred Games, pretty early on, it became very clear to me that this was going to be a long book, right? I could already see the 60-year timeline, and I knew there were going to be a lot of characters. And so since this was my third book, I understood this, for myself at least, this huge problem of... Uh, of all the stuff that you gather during the writing of a book, right? Your notes, you take, uh, uh, you go and do interviews uh, with people out in the field, so to speak. Um, I read a lot, right? Like secondary sources. And mm-hmm. and then, you know, how do you manage all this? And then um, how do you connect any of this to your manuscript itself, right? So if you're on page 400 and you need to look up, you know, what is my fact checks thing for this you know, the train leaves from such and such station kind of assertion. And you know you've got it somewhere, but you can't find the damn thing, right? Um, and then especially timelines are incredibly hard to handle, right? Because if, right. You, if you're placing your characters against real historical events, they have a certain age, right? And then you're trying to fit them another event like four years down the line, and you realize it's not going to work, right? Mm-hmm. And then once you move one event somewhere in your fictional story, like everything downstream and upstream also gets. And so the traditional tools, like I was saying, to deal with all of this is, you know, index cards and Mm. digital notes. Fat notebooks. Fat notebooks. Yeah. For Sacred Games, I ended up with this like fat little reporter's notebook, like about, I think, 25 of them by the end of it. Um, And then uh, timelines hand drawn on the wall, right? So I sure somebody must have written software to do this, right? It's such an obvious sort of thing. And I couldn't find any. And so after the book was finished and published, I thought I should try and hack together something to do this for me at least. Mm-hmm. And then I discovered I did some research and it, it's an incredibly hard problem actually to attach knowledge to text. Right. Uh, which is why people have been doing it for many years and but uh, were trying to do it, but... Um, way back from the 70s but um it hasn't been very successful so there haven't been very easy to use solutions built on top of that right because i observe that you've used a very uh, sort of a conceptual tag to it you know it's creating knowledge so yeah. when you're writing the book you're also creating knowledge yeah, which is not how uh, we sort of we don't necessarily look at it that way but of course that's right yeah 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 and i mean so writers do this, nonfiction writers do this, and in all other domains, right? You use text to represent knowledge, right? Events in the world, right? And so what would be, what is lovely is if you could like go back and forth between the two easily mm-hmm. uh, and then create it as you write, as you said. So I tend to get obsessed. So I fell into another 10-year obsession. And then one night in this house, I was like, okay, I have the glimmerings of a solution, I think. And then the next morning, it still made sense. So I ended up uh, writing a, what's called a software proposal document. Mm-hmm. And through uh, a series of 
happy coincidences. Oh, this is another friend of mine, Akash Kapoor, uh, yeah. writer. He's also a techie and and uh, and uh, writer himself. So through him, I met a friend of his who's a VC in San Francisco and had a meeting with him. And then through another stream, uh, you know, happy coincidence, I met my tech co-founder because what we are doing is pretty hairy engineering. I mean, it's way above my pay grade um, as a computer person or a programmer. So I'm very lucky I met Boris. Um, and and he's a like some sort of tech genius, right? And so uh, so we're doing this thing, yeah, and, and people should check it out. I mean, the entire idea is to is to make it easier for writers because it's always felt to me that that part of writing is like double entry manual bookkeeping. Right, right. And, and I think time is the most precious commodity for writers. You need time to think and work, right? So if you're spending time on doing this kind of stuff, you're taking away from what you should be doing. So it's just an, uh, it's an effort to make things, uh, what's the word, more transparent, easier to handle, take away uh, as much as we can of the cognitive load that, that the act of writing uh, puts on, on the writer. Right. I think what's uh, brilliant is that you've brought to it the intuitive feel for writing that a writer would have, right? So this brings me to the idea of, of process. What is your writing process like? Say, for example, with Sacred Games. Now, in uh, Love and Longing in Bombay, there is a little bit about Sartaj Singh, right? He, he mm -hmm. makes an appearance in one of the short stories. And so how did it begin? Did it begin does, or does it usually begin with a, with a mood or an image or one character? And then do you find your way in the dark, which is why also Granthika becomes so useful, yeah. something like Granthika. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, like you were saying, Sartaj appears in one story um, in, in Love and Longing in Bombay. I've always liked cop uh, detective procedural fiction, mm -hmm. so I wanted to write one. And then usually it happens after you finish a book, you know, your characters kind of fade from you. You say bye to them and it's a happy thing. Sartaj just stayed with me. Like I was like, he, this guy and I have some unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the time, and I'm talking like late 80s through the 90s in Bombay, as, as many of you will know, um, the underworld was and, and, you know, the influence on politics and all of that was incredible, right? So... Um, and then it came close. I mean, it's not like it was far away in the movies. It kept coming closer and closer. So my father and I, we lived in Lokanwala at the time and we were coming home from town and our car had just entered that main Lokanwala street. And suddenly we hear automatic weapons, gunfire echoing off the buildings. And that was that famous shootout in Lokanwala, which was, right. you know, made into a movie and so forth. Right. And then my family is connected to the film industry and I spend a lot of time I have mm -hmm. friends who work in the industry and I know people who were getting threatened, uh, who were getting shot at. Uh, a person I know was hit in the chest, barely oh, missed God. his heart. Um, and then my brother-in-law, Vidhu, um, and my sister, Vidhu started getting these calls and being who he is, you know, he told them where to get off. And then like, suddenly I go to his house and he's surrounded by these armed guards, you know. And it was weird how soon I got used to that, right? The mm -hmm. first couple of days, it freaked me out. And then I was talking to these guys about cricket scores and things. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so I just, I wanted to ask, like, what is going on? Why is this happening? Right? Um, and then, um, so I start writing this. And, and again, I have this vague idea of Sartaj in my head. And, and like you were saying, uh, at the beginning of the book, I just had Sartaj for some weird reason that I didn't know. He's sitting outside this bunker-like house in Bombay, talking to this gangster who's barricaded inside. And I had no idea why they were there <laughs> and, and who this guy was. And actually, I wrote my one of the very early versions of that got published in The New Yorker mm. in 97. If, so if somebody goes and finds that, they'll see it towards the end of that what worked as a short story, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like it's, yeah, it's like the, do that. Yeah, the confrontation is over and then Sartaj just drives to the seaside and ponders life, right? So, <laughs> so I had to end it there because I didn't know yet what was going on. So mm -hmm. then what I do is I, I follow the characters, right? That's the way it works for me. I ask who are these people? What do they want? What are they doing here? So exploring like who is Gaitonde became obviously one of the main threads through the book. 
and then simultaneously at the same time i i'd love to like go out and meet people mm. um who in any way aligned with what this mm. landscape i'm writing about and then with sacred games actually there's a i was meeting with a very senior cop in bombay and mm. you know i was asking him like so why does it work like this and he said listen um you know i can tell you whatever is happening on the ground here but if you really want to understand this larger game you have to go to delhi and meet x and y oh. and, and right. those guys were in the intelligence services hmm. right so so you uh, meet the raw um and ib guys right well yeah some some people in that world right and and oh. they were generous enough to talk to me very much off the record and so what happened was you know the the scale and the scope of the book had kept, kept getting larger i mean first of all i realized you can't write about organized crime before without writing about politics mm. right because mm. there's a organized crime cannot exist if there isn't political collusion right? right and and there's a exchange of value on both ends you can't talk about politics in today's india without talking about and that that india in today's india without talking about religion right obviously mm-hmm. uh, and then you cannot talk about this larger as the the my policeman friend was suggesting you can't talk about um about organized crime in a larger scale without thinking about how the intelligence agencies and the larger sort of cross border smuggling and movement of personnel and material right all of that works right so, so all of a sudden this damn book i was writing was blowing up right and so then you just settle in for the long track right <laughs> um and i kept wishing um throughout that book you know is there a better way to do this you know than suffer through this at least i mean there's agony in writing but that i accept right but this other stuff just seems extra to me right, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, right. Yeah. but also i think that sits uh, you know the fact that the book sort of was supposed to be a procedural let's say with yeah. sarthaj singh as the main guy but then it exploded and it became this 900 page epic mm-hmm. uh there's also something about structure in it right because when i was reading a uh, mirrored mind or or geek geek sublime and your exploration of uh, when you talk about how on the one hand you were reading these modernist american books mm. but within you sort of underpinning the stories that you wanted to tell was a sort of a deeper indian way of telling a story which let's say has that the ring structure or this sort yeah, of yeah. circularity which is incredible because in sacred games as you as you said that it's 60 years and there are these deeper let's say karmic connections which exist which we only get to know as it unfolds right yeah. so how deliberate was the structure or did you or, or do we admire it in retrospect <laughs> it happened on its own well no with sacred games i mean uh, no I, i can only figure out the structure and the shape of a book again by writing it which is intensely frustrating right because you feel like you're thrashing about like what am i doing the moments of despair like is this damn thing like worth anything so uh, I, I, the idea of writing alternate chapters you know between sartaj and gaitonde that came on pretty early but the structure i didn't understand like for the i would say for the first 12 <laughs> 15 drafts you know which were partial drafts but still and then so when i got it i had to go i mean i i realized that there was going to be a mandala structure right because there's a scene where sartaj goes to a bank and he sees these uh, buddhist monks yes. uh, making one of those temporary mandalas on the thing and i was like as soon as i don't know where that came from mm-hmm. i think i had seen something like that in uh, in bombay and i thought oh man this is it right this this is what is doing and then like it's a frightening moment as well because like what you've done in the past doesn't fit this right so this you have to make an adjustment although i have to say for the most part i tried very hard not to go back and revise what i'd already written right before i finished the complete first draft mm. because that way lies madness right because then you're stuck in this loop yes. of like endless revision so um but i i think looking back now um this this fascination with with indian um storytelling and pre-modern modes of thinking has been with me right from the first book right because um what happened with that was that uh, again it's a strange book it goes between the past and the present there's an actual uh, uh, one of the protagonists of that is james skinner 
mm. uh, Sikandar Skinner, who's a um, Anglo-British, uh, Anglo-Indian um, soldier of the 19th century. So he he was real, and then one of his the fictional protagonists along with him is a poet, right? So so my question was. what does a poet in the 19th century living in northern india what does he do and what does he think and how does he write poetry and i started then um uh sort of going back and had done some scattered reading in pre modern indian texts but then that gave me a focus um and then again with red earth and pouring rain the, i used these traditional modes of storytelling um so a friend of mine recently was asking pointing out to me that my entire life has been a kind of exploration and discovery at least for myself of mm. what existed before colonialism what happened during colonialism and then um i think we are all still deeply influenced by these modes of thinking in modern times and modes of structuring although we often are not conscious of this and we don't have a vocabulary to talk about this mm. and it's it's in sometimes in very generous and good ways but also very very often completely murderous and cruel right like as with the caste system uh, mm-hmm. which continues to exist in in grotesque fashion right among educated people as well right it's not just happening in the villages so so i guess you know you you uh, what you love <laughs> sometimes is maddening too right it can drive you nuts and so i guess i have that kind of relationship with the entire tradition right and right. and which is magnificent and very ugly in other respects right right and uh, in 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 mirrored mind what you've done where for example you talk about the rasa theory uh, the natya shastra or dhwani it it reminded me of you know when i first encountered the idea of, of the rasa to me it seemed that it explained a lot of bollywood yes. that is immediately the connection that my mind yeah, yeah. Had, yeah. right yeah. that yeah. again we need the structure so uh, vikram that brings me to the next question again coming back to the theme uh, of today sacred and the profane i think that you also deliberately muddle the line between them mm. right so sacred games is literary fiction but it's also police procedural <laughs> it's it's you know it's uh, let's say underpinned by the idea of of rasa and the indian aesthetic tradition but it's also uh, got this whole bollywood element right yeah. because you in fact put in a, a manu tiwari a screen writer in yes and i i love that right because he has these rules yeah. and some of those rules would also explain the book so you had a lot of uh, fun mm. playing around with that uh, so would it be right then to say that this is also something that you've uh, deliberately crafted the idea of 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 blurring the separation yeah yeah, yeah no absolutely uh, i mean i'm i'm often quite annoyed by the idea of genre right like of of uh, you know this and and it's basically a, a economic and marketing thing right and especially in physical bookstores you need to have different shelves to put different things under <laughs> you can't have them all in alphabetical order right so so it's a it's a modern invention of of these clear separating lines which has always seemed to be completely senseless right and what i hate about literary types is that you know uh, they will discover something or somebody will write like a detective story um and then everybody else will proclaim you know this detective story has escaped its genre origins and become a literary act right it's it's worth considering which is so it's just so annoying and silly right uh and and then also this other attitude that literary writers sometimes have oh i'm going to write a sci-fi story but i'm going to sort of you know go slumming a little and explore this other area which which normally literary writers don't do and again um i'm i, I guess the kind of fiction that i enjoy the most has all these qualities right of of propulsive narrative of deep characters and and high emotion right and and mm-hmm. combines all of this into a cocktail that i really really love um and so uh, i i often think of this and then i really as you can tell i like doing meta stuff right <laughs> so yeah. stories within stories within stories um to sort of have 
uh, elements within the narrative that like bring attention to the fact that it is a narrative and and i like that as a reader and as a writer right so i i, I guess one tends to kind of do what one is having fun with right and i think it's therefore it was very appropriate that sacred games became the first uh, of netflix's in their uh, shows right that it was a brand new medium and this was the book that made it so how attached were you to the book by the time the show came out were there things that bothered you yeah well no, i mean so uh, i mean you learn I, i've spent so much time in the film industry um, that i i mean i completely understand that as a writer the minute that you hand over a book uh, you have to lose any attachment to it otherwise you'll go mad right mm-hmm. because i mean necessarily so right because to make a good adaptation requires a radical leap right mm-hmm. and and just like in poetry right if you if you translate a poem literally you're not you're going to leave all the poetry behind right into another language so so um yeah so i i understood i mean even before any of this talk started that if it becomes if it goes to another medium it'll have to become something different right is this another world that is aligned with the book but is not the same world uh, it- but i have to say that that when uh, when the writers and you know vikram and varun and all of those guys uh, vasant and smita they sent me the first draft of the pilot that was quite a shock <laughs> because <laughs> that scene where parulkar shoots the guy right in an encounter it's like parulkar is supposed to be this you know he's sinister and he's like subtle but he's also very fatherly towards sartaj right <laughs> and so who the hell is who's this new guy right but then i completely got it right because you can't take sacred games the first 200 pages and like literally converted into something on screen because nothing happens in those first 200 pages right sartaj just like spends his time um um on uh, wandering around the city and like doing like little little detection things right uh, so so you need an antagonist you need the drama to start much faster right it's got to have a certain physicality about it um, and then in film and theater one of the interesting things is that you have to externalize everything right you you have no internal monologue right uh, you have no access to inner emotion so everything has to be uh, on on and that can be very fun but as a fiction writer i find that really hard to do hmm. uh, whatever screens writing stuff i've done that that's one of the major frustrations hmm. right the other is that i tend to write long and then you know in in screen time 2 minutes is an incredibly long time right, right. so like you you if you have a scene that on the page on the page goes over two or three screen play pages you're getting pretty damn long yeah. right yeah. right so um vikram you studied creative writing at a time when nobody in india thought that that was a let's say a a, a real thing to study right mm-hmm. your your mother was a writer and i think i i read somewhere or i heard in some interview where you talked about her writing her scripts at the kitchen table right yeah 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 so it was all about learning by doing now yeah, of course yeah. creative writing is being taught in indian universities as well uh what was it like at the time you know studying and you studied with two great post modernist masters john bath and donald bath him how was that no oh, it was it was amazing i mean i have to say that's one, one of the reasons that a major reason that i wanted to go to the states was that i was at st xavier's in bombay um doing uh, you know i was a english lit stream and i wanted to write and i i was writing a lot but i couldn't find anyone to actually read the stuff right except my friends and i had no idea if what i was doing was actually good or bad right uh um uh, and i mean i have to say nisim ezekiel uh, the amazing poet he was the i met him and he was very generous and he read stuff and but you know obviously as a writer he didn't have time he didn't have the head space and i'd heard this thing about you know creative writing workshops in the states i said that's where i have to go mm. um uh, and so that was the impulse and then once i got over as an undergrad like the first semester as soon as i got there i started doing this creative writing workshops thing and i found it really great um mm. and and 
you know, just the fact that there's like 15 people sitting around a table, paying serious attention to your manuscript, uh, mm -hmm. marking it up. And then also what happens in workshops is that by reading other people's work, you get such a huge education, right? And then watching other people read somebody else's manuscript, Absolutely. right? Because you get a sense of how language and affect works mm -hmm. and how transference of emotion happens. And then if you can watch people like Barth and Bartholomew mm -hmm. workshop a story, God, that was crazy, right? I mean, Bartholomew is this master of structure. He writes these huge sprawling novels mm -hmm. and, I didn't at all anticipate this, but he and I just like were, you know, he understood what I was trying to do with Red Earth and Pouring Rain. I mean, literally the first day I got to Johns Hopkins, I set up my computer and started writing the first paragraph, right? And then that was the stuff I started taking into Barth. Mm -hmm. And then that was only a year long, the MA program there. So towards the end of the year, he said, so what are you gonna do after this? And I mm -hmm. said, I have no idea. So he said, you should go to Houston and work with Donald Bartholomew. And I was like, Donald Bartholomew? Because Donald Don wrote these tiny, perfect jewel-like stories, right? And like, what is he gonna, like, he'll hate my stuff, right? So anyway, I went to Houston and Don was another extraordinarily generous guy and <laughs> completely like understanding, especially for obvious reasons of all this meta stuff, right? Because Don liked to do all this meta things in his own work. And then Don was a master of the sentence, right? So like he, if you, it was amazing to watch him, you'd read a sentence, you knew there was something off with it. And he would say something like, if you take out that comma and cut out the and, the sentence will work. And then you could hear it sing, right? Um, so, so that kind of, it's not directly related to your work, but observing somebody like that work, uh, that's that was amazing. And then you're also in a milieu of writers, right? Other people who are obsessed with the same things that you, as you. And I should say in India, we've had this tradition for centuries, like the Guru Shishya, Ustad, Shagird tradition. And that this was precisely what it was about. This young student uh, came and learned with, um, with a teacher. And it wasn't just about the work, the written word or the spoken word itself or the painting or the, you know, the music. It was about being in this entire world where you got to understand what the world was about, right? And <laughs> I, sh I mean, it sounds, this all sounds very mystical and gauzy. It's also it, hugely about networking, right? Yes. <laughs> How do you get into something is, is a matter of connections <clears throat> in all domains and all fields. So you understand what the political lay of the land is, right? Where the centers of power are. And, you know, you, it makes you cynical, but also like it, connects you up real fast into this whole uh, thing. Right. Okay. So before we move on to audience questions, which has already started coming, Vikram, uh, since it's the sacred and profane, I am going to do something profane in yes. our, um, you know, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to conduct a rapid fire round. Which ah, oh. is entirely inspired by coffee with Karan. Okay, are you ready? Uh, these are scary for me. Okay, because I don't, I can't think that fast. But go ahead. Okay, if Sacred Games had been made into a show in the eighties, uh -huh. who would have been cast as Gaitonde and Sartaj? Oh man, that's a good question. I think Amrish Puri as Gaitonde. Uh, I loved Arjun Satya, but I think he would have made a great Gaitonde. Mm -hmm. And as Sartaj. Uh, I don't know, maybe is it going back too far? I can I can mix decades, right? I would say Balraj Sani. Right? Uh -huh. Imagine Balraj Sani as, as Sartad Singh. Oh man, that would have been so awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In the grand tradition of the long and the very long novel, which I love, which you've added to, which is your favorite? Oh, I have to say Anthony Trollope's books, right? Oh. Uh, like these these amazing Victorian social observations, political novels. Um, the the five parliament novels, which are this grand sequence uh, set around you know love and economics in in uh, uh, and uh, so those are worth reading. I would recommend those highly to people. And one of my favorite novels of his is called The Way We Are Now, uh, oh. which is about this financier in shady oh. financier in London. It's it's astonishing in how it speaks to us in contemporary terms. You could read that today, and it would be about your life today. 
Yes, and also when mm. the entire Occupy wo- wo- uh, Wall Street was going on, and so on. That's the yeah. time when I read it, and it was absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and hey, I have to one more one more thing because this is one of my grand inspirations, and uh, he's a in my head he's another master. Is uh, William Makepeace Thackeray and Vanity Fair. If if I envy people who haven't read that book because they get to read it for the first time. And these are also great recommendations, Vikram, for lockdown quarantine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Long novels. Uh, Panini Bharata Vatsyayana, the greater genius. Oh man, can we not say all three are like a Trimurti? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because one is science, one is aesthetics, and one is the erotic, right? I mean, those are what what is life without any of those? Okay, so when the show was made, Sacred Games. uh they contemporanize certain characters right so yadav ji was a woman and yeah, yeah. kuku from being a very 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 minor sort of just a reference became a major character which change did you hate the most i don't know if i hated anything really but i think like i was saying the shock of parulkar becoming this other guy mm. uh, was was painful at the beginning but then i loved the guy uh, through through the entire two seasons Right. And, right and um i i don't think there was any other change that i really resented i mean pankaj tripathi as guruji was a revelation right <laughs> so all of those guys were uh were yeah i can't think of anybody um who re- really was different so the question that i think all are the audience everyone must be sort of you know their ears are cocked for this will sataj singh return i have no idea <laughs> like yes, so okay. is reunion that has now been announced right so a I, what sorry a friends reunion after oh yeah 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 no uh, i mean in uh, if you're asking in fictional or like tv terms uh, or or screen terms i have really have no idea right because um people keep asking me is there going to be another season and all of this i the writer is the last one to know right <laughs> and, and I mean, I'd love to read a Sardar. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, he's still on my mind, but I have this new fiction that I'm working on. Um, so maybe in the future, I don't know. I mean, if it would, if I would write something set in contemporary times, it would be an older Sardar, right? Yeah. So <laughs> much older Sardar. So I mean, maybe he's had kids. It would have to be son of Sardar, <laughs> possibly, right? Or daughter of Sardar, even better. <laughs> Well, okay. Yours is a family of writers and artists, Vikram. Who is the sanest? Oh, my dad, for sure. He's the he's the guy, the the corporate guy, the steady business guy who fed us all, who who worked really hard to send us all to do our arty pursuits, mm. uh, right? By so so yeah, he's a great guy, and and both of them are actually my mom and dad. Because not just for me, but for my sisters as well. They just said, okay. you know you don't have to become an engineer doctor ias person go do what you want and we'll try and support you right and so but but in terms of like calmness and sanity my father navin his name yeah. right okay last question of the rapid fire round vikram you've done very well i don't have a hamper to give you but uh well <laughs> favorite book set in bombay oh i i would say i think mean, i think jeet thiel's narcopolis i think is is one of the i mean and there's a whole slew of them that have come out in recent years that i have to say i haven't read but but um uh, uh, because i've had too much on my plate with all the software stuff and all of that but jeet is such an amazing writer and and i'm a great like fan of his i would if you haven't read that i would recommend it thank you vikram I am going to now read to you the questions that have come in from our. Oh, one second, one second. Can I can I add a footnote? Yes. So the the other favorite book that I've recently started reading is the English translation of Manto's Bombay stories. Not not fiction stories, his film writing and stuff, which no. is called no. Stars from Another Sky. Yes. It's astonishing, and and I, that's the Manto, another Manto that I really love. And again, in the sort of film lineage business, everything that he writes there like echoes down. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, it's gossipy, it's chatty, but it's so powerful, also searing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Om Prakash Parikh asks, "How is the Indian way of storytelling different from the Western style of storytelling?" 
Oh, so, so there's a couple of sort of major markers. Uh, and there's a very amazing scholar named David Schulman who's written at some length about this, about uh, how in, in um, subcontinental storytelling, the idea of the circle um, is repeated again and again, right? And you always find these echoes within areas of the circle, uh, uh, meaning that stories within stories and then the mandala idea of, of uh, uh, circular repetition, right? And one can see this in sort of the idea of the yugas as well, right? This idea of uh, repetition, but repetition that is different each time, right? And so it works like a spiral almost. Um, so if you think about the Mahabharat, right, for instance, uh, it, it's told at many levels of death, right? There's a guy who comes and sits down at a campfire and he says, I have heard a great story. And the other people who are these sadhus also say, tell us the story. And then he starts telling the story and then the stories within stories. So there's this feeling of expansiveness and generation uh, that is very different from the kind of Aristotelian, tight Aristotelian frame of the Western narrative, right? And uh, it starts in theater, but then starts to go elsewhere as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, all this idea of, of yeah, circularity, cyc cyclical um, events, um, spiraling, meta commentary, right? Uh, all of this. Mm. And you can see this, as you were saying, in, in uh, Indian films, right? Not just in Bombay, but across the board in all the languages. You know, that whole structure of the three-hour movie with all these emotions. Oh, that's another very important thing in terms of rasa, right? You don't want to have just one taste, right? Mm -hmm. You have to make a, like a thali. And mm -hmm. it can have one predominating taste at the end. But to really do that, you have to put in contrasting tastes, right? And then the in, in terms of film music, right? The first Indian movie has... Like what I put it somewhere in Geek Sublime, I'm forgetting. There's like uh, 20 odd songs in it, right? A 30 odd song. Mm -hmm. The first talkie. Mm -hmm. okay. So as as soon as you start making films, you draw directly on this huge like khajana of the past, which is all about music and and spoken word being together in dramatic narrative. Thing. Right. Uh we have uh, another question, Vikram. I'll just read that out. Uh, this is from Marie Cardona. Were you disappointed at the handling of Sartaj's mother's character and her backstory in the series? Uh, do you feel uh, the series did justice to the thesis you were trying to explore in the book? Well, so, you know, the trouble with film as always and, and even television series with their larger scope for narrative is the lack of time, right? So if you have a 900 page book, when you explore something, when you when you adapt it, you have to really choose. And there were like innumerable things left out of, out of the series, right? Mm. Um, so, I mean, that was like, I guess it made me sad that we couldn't go more into her past, but there was really no choice, right? I, I, there's certain compulsions of this narrative form and how much time it gives you. Uh, which makes it imperative. And I do know that they, they, they struggled very, very hard to keep the little there was in there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because, I mean, not because there was like producer pressure or anything like that from Netflix, but just managing all those elements yeah. within eight episodes, right, is incredibly difficult. Vikram, right. um, there's uh, another question from Sachdev Ramkrishna. As someone who's a brilliant techno artist, what is your view about the ancient uh, about the writing process on an ancient typewriter with its deliberate keystrokes and the auditory experience of the keys clacking? Yeah, no. See, I I, I think the the very important thing for all writers and all artists is like you have to choose the tools that work for you, right? And so uh, I would say that that if that works, um, you should do it, um, and and. I have to say that the first time I used, uh, uh, um, I was on a mainframe computer on a terminal, started writing fiction on that. I was like an instant convert. I literally cannot write fiction or any kind of sustained thing by mm -hmm. pen on paper anymore. But I do know people like who, who uh, still write longhand on paper. Then at some point they transfer it to the uh, word processor. And I mean, even in terms of computers, like, computer techie guys 
and women are obsessed with like the particular tools, right? You can't see it, but I have a very loud clicky keyboard. I don't know if you can hear it. Yeah. That that drives anybody else who's in the room with me, it drives them crazy. But I like the feel and the clickiness of that, right? And it's very crisp. And I mean, I spent like literally a couple of months researching the right keyboards and the keycaps. And then, you know, I pulled off the keycaps when I, and then I put in these rubber rings in oh. them to give me the light resistance, right? So, I mean, so you do all of this in order to make your writing flow, your workflow, right, move smoothly right so all the power i mean if you if you like using that that uh manual thing you know man just do it right and it's certainly more reliable right i'm so happy we haven't crashed yet on the zoom right yeah. <laughs> so so you know that manual typewriter will keep on going and going and going right it won't run out of battery right um i think we have time for only one one more question um there's no name to this who are your inspirations with regard to your writing style? Oh, a whole bunch. I mean, I mean, I, it's often it doesn't show in in obvious ways. So I would say somebody like Manto with the sh shock of his narrative, right? With with the sudden turns of revelation and violence. Um, we talked about Donald Barthelme. Like I was saying, he writes these tiny stories which are baffling to me. And how do you do so much in a page and a half? Mm -hmm. But he does it. And then, you know, reading his sentences, those Victorian people that I was talking about in terms of the scale, Trollope's sort of keen observation about how class and money works through a culture, even when it's pretending that all of those things don't. Um, uh, Thackeray in Vanity Fair with his, like, eye for misogyny, right, with institutionalized misogyny and sexism, and how Becky Sharp, who's the heroine, uh, anti-heroine, um, sort of defeats all of that, right, and survives in that world, and not just survives, but thrives. Right? Uh, so various, various people. And, and, uh, and Bollywood too, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I've grown up with me, it sustains me, I love, like all, and I mean, now there's this huge variety of, of films. I just watched Bulbul Bul a couple of nights back. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thrilled that you can make a film like that, right? And then have it released on a large scale, right? Uh, as opposed to the old film divisions um, finance days, right? right? Where you would get a little bit of money and not much of a release, right? Now, and now we're doing wide scale releases for these things. Right. Uh, Vikram, I'm afraid we are out of time. And so I'm going to request Sean Joy to take over now. Thank you. Thank you, Devapriya. That was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Devapriya. And thank you, Vikram. I mean, class and money running through cultures. And add to it, Vikram, what you just said, you know, the new class division, which is those who have bandwidth and those who don't. I don't yes. know what it's like in America, but certainly uh, in, in, in the subcontinent, that is going to be the due defining sort of Absolutely. difference in the same way that English was to many yeah. of us, you know, bandwidth yeah. is going to be that different. Yeah. But what a fascinating conversation. And, and thank you for joining us all the way from Berkeley. And thank you, Devapriya. And, and thank you guys for uh, viewing. And I'm sorry, we weren't able to get all your questions out to uh, Vikram. As usual, we, we always tend to run out of time because the conversations are so fascinating but thank you all uh, for watching and thank our official radio partner red fm uh, bajate raho our next session of the day will be the sari uh, professor mukulika banerji and malika varma in conversation introduced by rita kapoor chisti a session that explores the beauty adaptability and the fluidity of india's most iconic garment writer and anthropologist mukulika banerji has co-authored the sari Malika Varma has spearheaded the sari, an anthropology of drape. Together they speak of their relationship and connection with the sari and its timeless history. This will be at 8.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 4 p.m. British Summer Time, and 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So log in at 8.30 p.m. IST. See you soon. Thank you so much.